Shalom, and welcome to the first program of the new year, and first in a special three-part talking memory series, Invisible Years. We are honored to have the ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in Israel, His Excellency Hans Doctor, with us today, and he will be opening this special program in a few minutes. My name is Medin Shachar, and I work at the Ghetto Fighters House as an educator and a guide. I want to welcome our global audience, as you can see in the chat box, from all over the world, literally from all over the world, including friends and colleagues from Holocaust museums, institutions and centers, academics and students from universities, historians, and our many, many friends who attend our Talking Memory series. A special welcome to the survivors and their families that are with us today. We want to thank everyone for their support and interest in our programs. Today's program is in partnership with our friends in South Africa, the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation and the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Um, shalom, good evening, uh, guten avond for the deelnemers in Nederland. Um, shalom from Israel. Um, I, I'm so happy to be with so many people from, uh, from across the globe here tonight um, to, uh, for this very special occasion that the Ghetto Fighters House Museum has, uh, has organized. And it's a real honor that I am um, uh, allowed to uh, speak to you um, first. Um, the book, The Invisible Years, is, uh, is, is an amazing book. And I uh, met the authors and um, um, we had a, a beautiful exchange about the book uh, almost a year ago. And um, I'm, I'm really pleased it's, uh, it's being featured here today and that all of you can learn about it. It's really a book that, uh, that everybody should uh, read. Um, Daphne Geismar and Sharon uh, Grouse have done an incredible job in, uh, in piecing together the memories of their family members and what they experienced uh, during the Second World War, during the Holocaust in the Netherlands. Um, my name is Hans Doctor. Uh, I am the ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. And um, uh, I, I'm really honored that I can open this uh, first in a three-part uh, series of lectures. And the series is called Talking Memory, and it will focus on the, on the Netherlands uh, during the German occupation. The Ghetto Fighters House Museum already has a very special connection with the Netherlands. There's, of course, the, extent, the uh, extensive and exclusive Holland section in the museum, but the museum also hosted the Dutch exhibition in memoriam about almost 19,000 Dutch children who were deported from the Netherlands. It is a moving exhibition with loving portraits about some of these children. During the war, about 28,000 Dutch Jews made the courageous decision to go into hiding, to be separated from their loved ones and to hide from society, mostly in difficult situations, social isolation and with a change of identity. The family of Daphne and Sharon were among those who went into hiding. They had to rely on the goodwill of other people, sometimes on friends, sometimes on neighbors, but in most cases on total strangers, who, in danger of their own lives and that of their families, had the courage to save Jewish lives. I have, to, I have the honor to briefly introduce some of the speakers today. Daphne Geismar and Sharon Strauss, nieces, will share with us their extraordinary family history. They found, separate from one another, hidden in Holocaust drawers in their family homes, uh, a lot of material. Together they started to reconstruct their family's history during these horrible times. They tell the story of their eight family members, parents, grandparents, aunts, and uncles, in their own words, alongside photographs, letters, diaries, and artifacts. You will understand how they were slowly restricted from public life and discover how they survived in an imminent danger, in attics, under floorboards, and in plain sight. Uh, another speaker today is Professor Robert Jan van Pelt. He is a distinguished uh, scholar from the Netherlands on historical architecture and the historical facts of the Holocaust. He has actively combated Holocaust denial. He will elaborate on the distinct atmosphere that characterized the daily lives of Dutch Jews in the Dutch society in the decade before and during the German occupation. The Holocaust happened more than 75 years ago. As the first generation of survivors is exceedingly no longer with us, this is creating a void. We must look for other ways and means to keep remembering and learning from the Holocaust. It is our collective duty to make sure that the horrors of the Holocaust are never forgotten. To remind ourselves, to warn future generations of what is separation, discrimination, and racism and what it can lead to. 
Defne and Sharon are stepping into this void with a moving testimony about their family. In Amsterdam, just three weeks ago, the National Holocaust Name Monument was opened um, to commemorate more than uh, to commemorate the more than 102,000 Dutch Jews, Roma and Sinti that were deported and murdered. To quote a speech of the mayor of Amsterdam during the opening ceremony, which I was uh, uh, honored to be able to attend, the mayor said, in our capital now live the names of those who were not allowed to be, to be here. They will be here forever. As long as we remember, talk about them, read, our, read their names and say Kaddish for them, they are still with us. Midor Lador, from generation to generation. To hear the testimonies of what people went through, to see exhibitions, to attend lectures, and to visit memorial sites are all part of learning from these dark times and make sure that we never forget. Let us open the Holocaust doors. I wish you an interesting and meaningful lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for your words. And I know that uh, having that personal connection with the family makes it all that uh, special for us, and it's such an honor. Uh, I now would like to invite Igal Cohen, the CEO of the Ghetto Fighters House, to say a few words. Igal. Hello, everyone. I would like to thank His Excellency, Hans Doctor, the Ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in Israel, for your kind words, for opening this series of program about that jury during the Holocaust, and for joining us for this important event it is an honor for me and for all of us at the Ghetto Fighters House. The story of Jewish community in the Netherlands during the Holocaust is for us a legacy of compelling events and miraculous rescue operations. Yet, cooperation with the Nazis is also part of this complex history. Sadly, quite a few Jews were handed over to the Nazis. In this program, and the following two in November and December, a window will be opened, allowing us to delve into the history of this community, and we shall shed light on acts of heroism involved in hiring Jews in the Netherlands at great risk. At the Ghetto Fighters House, we see great importance in such resistance, and are happy <coughs> for the opportunity to serve as a platform for the story behind invisible years. We value the inspiration these stories hold for us today and for future generations. I would like to thank Medin Shachar for organizing this event, as well as, as our partners, the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation and the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. A special thank you to the speakers today, Daphne Geismer, Sean Strauss, and Professor Robert Jan van Pelt, and to the hundreds of guests who are joining us from all over the world. Thank you for your support. Wishing us, wishing us a meaningful series and an uplifting experience. Thank you. Thank you, Iga. Uh, the inspiration for this series is the captivating memoir, Invis Invisible Years, a family collected account of separation and survival during the Holocaust in the Netherlands that was designed and written by Daphne Geismer. In today's program, Daphne, along with her cousin Sharon Strauss, will introduce us to their family story. To help us understand the historical context, we are honored to have Professor Robert Jan van Pelt, who worked closely with Daphne and contributed the historical background to the personal experiences of Daphne and Sharon's family. So after I introduce our three speakers, they will start their joint presentation, a three-way conversation that will introduce us to the unique situation of the Netherlands and its Jewish community during the Holocaust. I will start with Daphne. When Daphne Geisner decided to publish a history of her family's experiences during the Holocaust, she summoned all of her skills to write, design, and produce Invisible Years. Geisner plans, designs, and produces books on art and history for museums and publishers, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Museum of Modern Art in New York, Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and Yale University Press. Her designs have won numerous awards from organizations such as the American Alliance of Museums, the Association of American University Presses, AAUP, 
the Association of Art Museum Curators and the New England Book Show. She has been a juror for AAUP and the American Institute of Graphic Arts. For her MFA in graphic design at Yale University, Geismer's thesis project revealed new findings about Direction Magazine, an anti-fascism periodical run by artists and writers at the outset of World War II. As an educator, Geismer developed and taught a photography and writing program for teenage mothers at Middlesex Hospital. She teaches book design at the University of Connecticut, and she has lectured and been a visiting critic in graphic design at a number of colleges and universities. Sharon Strauss is Daphne's cousin, and she is a key researcher for her family members' counts in invisible years, especially in Israel, where she lives. Strauss works as an umbrellogist in the IVF unit at Alicia Hospital in Haifa, and in layman words, she makes babies every day. Uh, Sharon holds a BSc and MSc in biology and molecular genetics and a registered nursing degree. She worked for a company that researched and developed kits for identifying genetic diseases and then as a nurse in the neurosurgical department at Rambam Hospital in Haifa. And last but not least, Professor Robert Jan van Pelt. Van Pelt is taught at the University of Waterloo School of Architecture since 1987 and held appointments at many institutions of higher education in Europe, Asia, in North America. At this time, he is guest professor at the University of Kassel, Germany. In Germany, he has published 12 books dealing with diverse topics, very diverse topics, such as the cosmic speculations on the Temple of Solomon, relativism in architectural history, the history of Auschwitz, the history of the Holocaust, Jewish refugees and Holocaust denial. At this time, he is completing a book on the history of the concentration camp barrack. His forensic work on the crematoria of Auschwitz generated the evidence room installation shown first at the 2016 Venice Architecture Biennale. And Van Pelt is the chief curator of the international traveling exhibition, Auschwitz, not far away, not long ago, shown in Madrid, New York, and currently in Kansas City, Missouri. I wanna thank you all for joining us today and the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Daphne and I are going to tell you about a journey that began in 2006, when we were invited to attend a gathering at a church in Rotterdam, where our grandparents hid in an attic for two years. Over the next 14 years, we discovered the stories of our parents and grandparents living under German occupation in the Netherlands. Our book, Invisible Years, is a kaleidoscope of family members speaking to one another, when in reality, they couldn't. Through their voices, we're transported into their world. As Maiden just explained, Robert Jan provided historical context for the personal stories in our book. And I'm delighted and honored that he's with us today to provide this information live. Thank you very much uh, for having me uh, uh, here. I am here actually in Berlin, <coughs> only a kilometer or two from the, uh, from the Fuhrer bunker. And uh, because I, am, uh, I arrived here in the apartment that I'd signed up for, uh, was actually not available because a person a day before my arrival who was still staying there got COVID. So he's in quarantine, I'm somewhere else. And I really don't think that he, connection is that great. So if I fall away, we can blame uh, the Germans. I don't care, COVID, whoever. <laughs> Any case, I have five minutes to draw a very, very uh, broad picture of the situation that, that the Netherlands found itself in before the Second World War, which for the Netherlands started on the 10th of May, 1940. Uh, the Netherlands had remained neutral during the First World War. And so um, it also expected in the 1930s, when Nazi Germany started to become uh, uh, an aggressive power, uh, uh, which was uh, keen to undo the uh, results of the Second, of First World War uh, embodied in the Versailles Treaty, uh, the Netherlands or the government of the Netherlands and the population in general thought that they would again remain neutral as in the First World War. Um, in fact, uh, this naivete that existed in the Netherlands, which also led to the fact that the country didn't have any um, kind of uh, alliance, military or political alliance with any other country, um, was a reflection of the fact that the Dutch in some way had for missed the great modernization 
that uh, had reshaped uh, many other uh, major countries in Europe in the 19th century. It was only a partially in the, in, in industrialized country. It was a country that very much uh, lived in the past. Uh, its colonies in the Dutch uh, East Indies and in the West Indies were important in, in, in some way shaping its identity. And also its society was a very strange and unusual uh, kind of old fashioned society. The, the, the creation of a nation state uh, which had really uh, shaped uh, the, uh, the project of the 19th century, starting with France and later, of course, Italy and Germany quite dramatically with the unification of these countries, had never really taken hold in the Netherlands. Of course, there was a, a Dutch nationalism that centered on the House of Orange and also on its glorious uh, 17th century history. But as a society, Dutch society was fragmented in what we, uh, what, what the Dutch called Zuilen, or in English, it's called columns. That is, there were a number of minority societies, the largest being the Catholic uh, part of the country, around uh, a little over 30%. And basically the societies, uh, Calvinist Protestants, not so Calvinist Protestants, and so on and so on, they lived more or less beside each other in a contract of mutual indifference at best, uh, but also in competition. So, um, and, and this was for the Jewish community very important in the way the Jewish community, which was only a small community around 110,000 Jews before 1933, when German refugees start arriving. First of all, uh, there is in the Netherlands no major anti-Semitism. There is some kind of social anti-Semitism, which one would decry, which one basically describes as being "quote unquote" normal in Europe at the time. But no political anti-Semitism because the political landscape is very much fragmented, and the Catholics are in competition with various uh, Protestant denominations, the Socialists, with the Liberals, and so on. In that sense, the, the reason to make Jews into a scope, uh, into a, a scapegoat for all the ills of society, uh, the ground doesn't really exist in the Netherlands for that, because uh, the Catholics certainly are happy to make the whatever problems they see. Second of all, the, the Jewish community is very small, but of course that doesn't mean there cannot be anti-Semitism. You can even have anti-Semitism without, um, without, uh, without any Jews, as we know today. But also it's very important that the Jewish community, unlike the one in Germany, was actually quite marginal economically. While there were a number of, of, of wealthy families, uh, especially they had created big department stores or owners of textile factories in the East in Enschede, uh, and or, while there were Jewish professionals, the great majority of Jews were very poor. And this was very different in Germany, where Jews had very much uh, basically taken advantage of the opening in the second half of the 19th century of society and had become very visible in society. In the Netherlands, this was not really the case. It was a provincial community. Also, the Jewish community was disconnected from the great movements in Judaism elsewhere in Europe, uh, be it, uh, be it uh, Zionism or other things. So when we are starting to, to, to talk about this community, it is in some way invisible in Dutch society, not completely. I mean, uh, especially in Amsterdam, the, uh, the, the, the great markets, there are many people working in the markets. And then finally, there is something else that is, of course, to do with the Dutch are an incredi incredibly bourgeois country. And the bourgeoisie is, as long as it basically is not uh, destroyed by inflation or depression, uh, the bourgeois just doesn't like extremism. And so the Dutch were able to avoid uh, the kind of anti-Semitic and extra extremism up to 1940, with the exception of one political party, which in the mid-1930s started to adopt Nazi ideas, the National Socialist Beweging in the Netherlands, a Dutch Nazi party, but they, they're, they're marginal until 1940. So by and all, by 1940, by the 9th of May 1940, one can say, with the exception of the debates that had started as a result of the arrival of German Jewish refugees, that there was no Jewish question, no, no Jewish problem in the Netherlands. Thank you. Our parents and grandparents, Chaim and Fifi de Zutza, lived and thrived in that pre-war Netherlands that Robert Jan just described, where they were integrated into Dutch society and experienced relatively minimal anti-Semitism. This is our family tree. 
everyone in the top two rows are narrators in our book. Uh, Daphne and I are cousins. I'm in Israel, Daphne is in the United States, uh, because this is where our parents settled after surviving the Holocaust in the Netherlands. Our mothers, Miriam and Judith Dezute, are sisters. The Dezute family lived in a beautiful and cozy house in Rotterdam. Our grandfather Chaim was chief pharmacist for the city. He was a quiet and curious man who was interested in many things, particularly philosophy. Our grandmother, Sophia, or Fifi as everyone called her, was a feminist, a nurse, and a director of a children's hospital before she was a wife and a mother. She was opinionated and sociable. My mother, Miriam, is in the center. She's the oldest Dezuta girl. Sharon's mother, Judith, on the right, is one year younger than Miriam, and Hadassah, a year younger than Judith. Miriam was protective, Judith was sensitive, and Hadassah was easygoing. Miriam described their childhood like this. We were truly quite innocent. We lived on a very nice street near a park and a lake. We had a very nice life, really, before the war. My father, Nathan Cohen, was a curious and playful boy. He lived in Appledorn, in the center of the country where he spent most of his time with his friends. His father was a general practitioner. My father said, I remember it as a continuous time of spring and summer. My best friend was Hank, who were part of a gang of kids. A nearby garden of an empty house was our territory. This is my father and grandfather, David and Erwin Geismar. David and his parents emigrated from Germany to the Netherlands. Erwin had a factory where he designed and manufactured leather accessories. David was mischievous and loved to play with other kids in his Amsterdam neighborhood. He wrote about his relationship with them. I knew I was Jewish like the next kid was Protestant, Catholic, or whatever. I never felt singled out or treated differently from any of my friends. In early 2006, my mother received a phone call from a colleague. She said, you are a deserter, right? Her colleague had just seen an ad in a newspaper for Dutch immigrant in Israel, placed by the Breplain Church in Rotterdam. They were looking for relatives of Chaim and Fifi Dezute to invite them to the 75th anniversary celebration. This was the first we heard about our grandparents hiding in the attic of the church during World War II. 11 of our family members went to the Netherlands to attend the celebration. When we returned to the United States and Israel, Daphne and I asked our mothers to tell us more about their experience during the war. My mother led me to an antique desk and opened the bottom drawer. It was filled with letters, diaries, and documents about our family members' experiences during the Holocaust. I called Sharon to tell her the news about the Holocaust store, and she told me that her mother had a Holocaust store too. Under all the documents, you can see the drawer lining, liner, the, the paper liner peeking through in this photograph. And that lining paper became the end papers of our book. In the Holocaust drawer, we found accounts from our grandparents, Chaim and Fifi, their three daughters, Miriam, Judith, and Hadassah, our fathers, Nathan and David, and Daphne's parental grandfather, Erwin. They became the eight narrators of our book, Invisible Years. So, um, on the 10th of May, uh, 1940, the German Wehrmacht invades uh, Luxembourg, Belgium, the Netherlands, and France uh, as, a, as an attempt to basically uh, reach the, uh, the, the, uh, the coast and, uh, and start the siege of England, and of course also defeat uh, the, great, uh, the great antagonist France. The Netherlands is really a sideshow in this war, uh, and it, uh, at least for the Germans and for the other allies, it doesn't get any significant support from the other allies, and after five days, the Dutch army capitulates. 
The government, however, and the royal house um, flees to, uh, to, to Britain. Uh, they establish a government in exile there. And of course, the wars continued both with the Dutch merchant fleet, the Dutch Navy, and of course, the colonies in the West and East Indies. The Germans establish a occupation regime that's led by a Austrian, Arthur Seiss Inquart, who was the leader of the, uh, the Austrian Nazi party and, uh, and, and, and really the last chancellor of, of, of Austria, who officially handed the country over to Hitler after the Anschluss. Um, and and Seiss Inquart had to, had, was given the job by Hitler to Nazify the Netherlands and prepare the Netherlands for its annexation by the, uh, by, by the German Reich, a full annexation, so no permanent state of military occupation. Um, and the reason, of course, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, Hitler was interested in annexing the Netherlands was because the Dutch were fellow Aryans. They were considered to be uh, good racial material, as it was called at that time. Um, and so uh, this makes the situation in the Netherlands very different from that of Belgium or for that matter France. Uh, that is that the Dutch are going to be subjected to this Nazification and that means that in some way the German regime established an every single nothing approach uh, to, uh, to the occupation. So the German army which runs the occupation in France and Belgium is in the background and these are civilians. Uh, supported by, uh, by the security services who need to uh, make the Netherlands ready for its uh, incorporation in the German Reich. Uh, very important in this Nazification program is also the, uh, the removal of the Jews from Dutch society. And uh, in, in, uh, in August 1940, Seiss Inquart arrogates to himself as part of this, uh, of, of preparing the Dutch, a, uh, uh, the right to, to fire any Dutch civil servant. Now, Dutch civil servants have, uh, of course, tenure in general, and the rules of occupation, of, of, of military occupation, uh, state that the occupying power is not allowed to make any changes in the legislation of the occupied country. However, uh, Seiss Inquart um, uh, violated that rule at that moment. And uh, what was interesting was that uh, the Dutch civil service, the heads of the Dutch civil service who have remained behind, the government ministers were in England, did not protest. That meant that in some way it became clear to Seiss Inquart at that time that he had a relatively willing, accommodating uh, Dutch uh, civil service at his, uh, uh, at his side. Um, and, and when later the uh, Supreme Court in the Netherlands, the Hoge Raad, looked into this decision, uh, if, uh, the, uh, if, if the Germans could fire any uh, civil servant, they basically decided not to take a position. Now, what made the uh, decision uh, very important is that the... Um, that, the, uh, uh, that many people in the, in, in the Netherlands, unlike in other countries, are civil servants. Teachers are in general, even uh, primary school teachers, professors, and so on. It's not only uh, people who directly work for the government. Um, this, this, this attitude of accommodation basically meant that there was no resistance when the heads of the civil service asked civil servants that meant also everyone who was paid by the government to declare if they had uh, Jewish ancestors. Uh, most Jews uh, complied. And uh, immediately after this census was taken, um, uh, basically uh, the uh, German occupiers started to lay off uh, the uh, people who had more than two uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish uh, uh, grandparents. Um, this then also initiated a, uh, a larger removal of Jews from Dutch society. Uh, bank accounts were blocked and so on. Businesses were taken into uh, protective care, as it was called. And from February 1941, the Germans forced uh, the Amsterdam community to establish a Jewish council after riots had broken out in Amsterdam uh, in, the, uh, Jewish, uh, in the Jewish quarter. Now, the, the, the problem with the Jewish council, uh, and, and in some way the history of every Jewish council in occupied Europe is different, is that each of the members of the Jewish council were uh, absolutely upstanding people with an incredible record of charity before the war. 
uh, David Cohen, uh, the chairman, the co-chairman of the Jewish Council, have been central in trying to, uh, to help German refugees who arrived to the Netherlands and central in trying to get the Dutch government to be, to be more welcoming. But it was exactly this this, 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 this approach, the fact that all of them were upstanding citizens who had spent a life in charity that in some way made them blind for the fact that the Jewish Council was not going to function anymore as a charitable organization, but in some way had a political function to basically translate the wishes and orders of the German to the Jewish uh, community at large. And so when the, 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 the persecution in the second half of the uh, 19, uh, 1941 started to sharpen, ultimately leading to the deportations beginning uh, in, in May 1942, the Jewish Council always saw its task as try to lessen in some way the, the, uh, the impact of the Jewish measures on individual Jews, but never saw actually that what was really demanded of them was a firm political position. And this, in this sense, they became unwilling, unwitting uh, collaborators with the, uh, with the uh, occupation regime. Uh, just to summarize in one sentence, and, and I think that this is enough of a, of a judgment on the Jewish Council, uh, their approach. When in 1945, uh, one of the co-chairmen, David Cohen, returned from Theresienstadt, and he was asked to reflect on his uh, actions as chairman of the Jewish Council until September 1943, when he himself was arrested and deported, he said he was proud of the fact that no train left for Auschwitz with Jews on it who didn't have an extra pair of socks in their luggage. Thank you very much. This is the masthead of the first issue of the Jewish Weekly, which is a newspaper published by the Jewish Council that Robert Jan just told us about, specifically for the Jewish population. This paper was controlled and heavily censored by the German occupying administration who banned all other newspapers. In published it published articles on literature, art, history, and religion and disseminated anti-Jewish orders on the front page. By establishing a publication that was for Jews only, the Nazi rulers prevented non-Jews from reading and from knowing about their published in intimidations. In this issue, the front page includes an article about Yom Kippur, a call for teachers, and at the bottom right, anti-Jewish measures. Article one says, Jews are forbidden, to participate in public gatherings, followed by a long list of specific prohibitions. And Article 5 says, for example, that if Jews are granted permission to hold a meeting, there must be a sign on the door that says Jewish room, because non-Jews must not enter. Every chapter of our book, uh, Invisible Years, open with a historical introduction. The chapter titled Forbidden groups anti-Jewish orders with the narrator's account of how each discriminatory law affected their lives. On the left page, you can see the interwoven uh, voices. You can see Nathan, Judith, Miriam, Fifi, Erwin, and Chaim talking uh, about how their lives changed when Jewish were fired from government jobs due to November 21st, 1940 decree. In the photograph, our grandfather, Chaim, is on the left. He was the head pharmacist at a municipal pharmacy in Rotterdam. He lost his job because of the anti-Semitic uh, order. As a result, the Desote family had to move to a smaller house in another town, and the girl had to leave their beloved school and friends. Anti-Jewish oppression escalated from 1940 to 1942, with each Nazi decree that separated Jews from their rights property and lives. We learned the details from our family members. After radios were confiscated in spring 1941 and we were prohibited from cafes and bars in the summer, Jews could not travel without a permit. All Jewish valuables were confiscated and everyone was required to deposit their assets in a special bank created for this purpose. Every year there was a fair in Appledore 
1942 was no exception. Signs for forbidding entry for Jews were displayed. I once went anyway, but I did not enjoy it since I felt like a fugitive. Even while riding the merry-go-round, which usually was one of my favorite attractions, with its loud umpapa music. Jews were not allowed to own cars or bicycles, and we weren't allowed to go on the tram anymore. My sisters and I left for school on our scooters for a tiring one-hour trip each way. We wondered, why are we losing everything when we are no different from our friends who aren't Jewish? The multitude of decrees and range of deprivation is mind blowing. In August 1941, just before the school year was to start, Jewish children were forbidden from attending public schools. This is a photograph of Miriam's class before the occupation. She's in the second row wearing the dark flower print dress. Chaim and Fifi made arrangements for the girls to go to an improvised school with Jewish teachers. Miriam's opinion about this? We were about to be murdered by the Nazis and our parents were still worried about our education. In the spring of 1942, Jews were ordered to wear a Jewish star on their clothing. We found my mother Judith star, Judith star in her Holocaust row. My aunt and uncles told us how they felt about wearing the star. I remember how awful I felt whenever I was outside. I knew I wasn't bad, but I felt ashamed. You were a non-person, a person people didn't want to associate with. You were different. Maybe you are bad because the Germans said Jews are bad. It's terrible when you are told, there goes this person with the star, don't associate with her. It makes you feel like you are nothing. I understood that being Jewish was walking around with the yellow star of David. Before that, we had no awareness of Jewishness. And David, in his usual straightforward manner, said, we were marked. On July 5th, 1942, summons were sent to 4,000 Jews to report for transport to the East. On the same date, telephone service was disconnected for Jews. One month later, 2,000 Jews were rounded up. Raids increased as Jews went into hiding rather than show up for transport. On August 19th, the Dezuta girls, ages 9, 10, and 11, left their parents and each other to go into hiding. Their cousins in this photograph reported for transport. My mother's sister, Yet, and her husband thought that as long as we did exactly what the Germans said, then we'd be, we'd be okay. They went when they were told to go for the transport. They went with their two kids, including their oldest daughter, my best friend, who had the same name as me. They went and they never came back. As raids to round up Jews increased, Chaim and Fifi made the extremely difficult decision that their family would go into hiding, sending each daughter separately to increase their chance of survival. Uh, so, so, so uh, let me start with just uh, mentioning the Dutch word for hiding, uh, onderduiken, which quite literally means to submerge. So uh, it, it beautifully, uh, in some way, uh, relates to the Dutch uh, obsession with water and, and, and trying to survive uh, in a situation of a country that's underwater if it weren't protected by the dikes. There really were two kinds of ways that one could hide. The first way is to hide visibly, that is, adopt another identity. Uh, now, in the Netherlands, that was extremely difficult for a number of reasons. The first is that it, it's a small country, which is an extremely um, a professional civil service and a, uh, a famously accurate register of, 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 of its citizens. So uh, everyone was registered uh, where everyone lived, and it was very difficult in this small country to be invisible from an administrative point of view. Second of all, the Dutch had introduced in 1941 on orders of the Germans, but with a lot of Dutch ingenuity in terms of the printing, uh, a, uh, a, 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 an internal passport that was very difficult to, uh, to forge. Uh, and... Uh, uh, 
every taken that 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 document and so how to actually create a forged version remain became a very big issue and few of these forged versions really uh could survive a close inspection third of all hiding visibly uh, was difficult because uh, despite for its apparent cosmopolitanism, uh, Dutch society was very parochial because of its this pillar kind of condition. People knew each other very well. Um, to, to basically uh, uh, arrive in a community and not be already part of that community. The only exception was when large scale evacuation started to happen from the coast, especially from The Hague, which became part of the city on the coast, which became part of the Atlantic Wall. And so the typical kind of explanation for a Jewish refugee uh, going to Gelderland, Friesland or Limburg would be I'm an evacuee from The Hague. Uh, but even that became quite transparent. Now, to submerge uh, in the way that the Zutte family did, or of course, uh, famously also Anne Frank, to live completely hidden without any access and any participation in civil society was even more difficult. Uh, because first of all, one was not uh, going to be part of the uh, food rationing system, or for that matter, the rationing of anything. Uh, of course, and by 1942, that was uh, uh, basically a, 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 a absolutely essential for survival to, to be, have access to that. Uh, second of all, um, you basically, uh, and the Frank family is a great exception, most families separated. And now, uh, as a parent, you had to be willing to let your children be uh, taken care of by people you quite often didn't even know. Uh, most often one didn't even know where the family uh, members were for their so-called own protection. And you had to, um, to, to be willing to, uh, to basically retreat into a life that could be a small room in an attic, or uh, it could be with, 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 with times that you actually had to hide, so, so to speak, under the floorboards or a, a, in a closet without actually knowing how long it was going to last. Uh, uh, is this going to be a month? Is this going to be a year? Is it going to be 10 years? Or is this going to be forever? The option of uh, flight was very difficult because to the east was Germany, to the west was the North Sea, which was patrolled by the German Navy, and to the south, the closest country where one probably could try to fly to was Switzerland. One had to go through occupied Belgium and occupied France. And of course, the Swiss, as we know, were not very willing to receive Jewish refugees until quite, uh, quite uh, the second part of 1943. So, uh, so you were you were completely dependent quite often on strangers many people who did it out of idealism some people did it simply for the money um, abuse happened of course in these situations uh, we are much more aware of it and attuned to these issues than we than probably people were in even the 1960s or 70s when they started to research this uh, and of course one thing that uh, that 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 very few people talk about, but which I find actually quite interesting, and which the psychiatrist uh, Kelson, who himself was a survivor of uh, the hiding experience, reflected on in, in 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 great lengths. Also, how do you live for year after year, being forced to be grateful to your hosts? What actually does that mean? And so 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 so, so hiding. Uh, is a is it, it is from a physical point of view of, of, of you very difficult experience you're isolated you have no idea what's happening uh, and then you are bound in this incredible difficult situation of continuous gratitude to people who in one way deserve it but in the other way also at times it might create a very difficult emotional reactions uh, on both sides, by the way, uh, both with those in hiding and those who did the hiding. Thank you. Thank you. When the Jesuitas first separated to go into hiding in August 1942, Four of the girls' cousins were murdered in Auschwitz that same month. Natan's family, the Cohens, went into hiding five months later in January 1943. By that time, seven of Natan's aunts, uncles, and cousins had been murdered in Auschwitz. David's family, the Geismars, went into hiding in March 1943. That month, the aunt, uncle, and cousin who David spent summers with 
were murdered in Auschwitz. The American and British governments finally met in April 1943, but they avoided discussing the Nazis' intention to annihilate the Jews and didn't make plans to take more Jewish refugees. The chapter title Invisible opens with this map of the hiding addresses for eight narrators, the names of those who protected them, and the date range of the narrator's stay. The map flips out to show the hiding places in the east. In total, the map shows 27 documented hiding addresses for eight people. There was a lot of moving around in the first year of hiding. Then moving around became too dangerous and everyone isolated in long-term hiding addresses. When I first read through all of our family members' accounts, I realized that no one person had the complete story, but their collective accounts made it whole. I saw that the narrators offered multiple perspectives on a shared experience. So I cut up everyone's accounts, created content groupings, and then sequenced the groupings and excerpts within them to create a single narrative. This is the first draft. When I first read The Interwoven Voices, it was like my family members were talking to one another and to me. I finally understood how the genocide happened, how extreme racist policies turned society from normal to precarious, and how my family members felt when they lost their human rights and identity. And I put my, table, my head on the table to weep. The structure for the interwoven manuscript worked well for the first four chapters before trapped, forbidden, and separated. For this next chapter, Invisible, I spent weeks trying to successfully weave the voices, but I couldn't make it work. I thought I was going to have to find a new structure for the book when I finally realized what seems obvious in hindsight. When the narrators are isolated from the world and one another, their voices have to be separate. You can see in the contents that each individual has a subsection within the invisible chapter to tell about their unique experience. When the narrators come out of hiding and are reunited in the chapter titled After, their voices are interwoven again. Miriam was the first to leave home. She was 11 years old. Her braids were cut and her name was changed to Mania. She was told not to cry because her departure had to look as normal as possible. Judith and Hadassah left home together. Shortly after, they were placed in separate homes. Judith wrote about the day they left. After the arrangements were made, our parents told Hadassah and me, go to Uncle Kess, but before you reach his house, make a stop under one of the bridges on the way and take off your jacket with the Jewish star and leave it there. Once you reach his house, he will take care of everything. Under the bridge, on our way to Kess House, I took off my jacket and put it in a bag I had with me and really forgot about it. At that moment, I didn't realize the danger of keeping the star. After Chaim and Fifi knew the girls were settled in their initial hiding addresses, they left for their first temporary address. Our grandparents changed hiding places eight times in eight months. On April 23rd, 1943, they were once again in desperate need of a hiding place. Chaim wrote about this day in a letter to Yad Vashem. On this day, every Jew had to disappear or present themselves voluntarily at the concentration camp of Vuk. And Fifi wrote in her diary, today is the last day that the Germans are tolerating Jews in the Netherlands. Does everyone have to go to Vuch? My husband and I won't go. April 23, 1943 was the day Chaim and Fifi first met Reverend Brillenburg Wurz and his wife Herda. When the Reverend asked his sexton to prepare a hiding place in the attic of the Breplin Church, the sexton told him that he has already been hiding a Jewish family there for a year. They agreed to prepare a second attic for Chaim and Fifi. I want to pause for a moment to mention that Kina Brillenburg Wurz will be one of the presenters in the November 4th, 14th session of this series. 
Kina is the granddaughter of the Reverend and Herda. She will uh, retrace the stories from the perspective of the protectors. Initially, the pastor wife takes care of us, but she has to cross a small courtyard. <clears throat> this works just fine until uh, she realizes that the neighbors are spying on her. The sexton wife can reach us from the inside, so she brought us food every day until the very end. And if you were down in the dump, she climbed into a hiding place, she called it the hole, and helped you surface again. After hiding in the attic behind the organ for almost two years, and shortly before liberation, there was a Nazi raid on the Bright Plain Church. Our grandfather Chaim wrote about the terrifying event and included this drawing of their hiding place. I hear someone walking through the church, so I go over to the window from where the organist has a full view. Carefully, I hold the edge of the opaque green curtain against the wall and use my finger to create a small crack, only to grow rigid with fear. On the podium below me, between the pews, there are two green police walking around searching everything. And then comes the stage of paralysis, the sense that all is lost. There's still a small chance now the super heavy ladder has to be raised. It can't be done hand over hand because that would make the ladder sway and bump. Throw it up, let it go and catch it again, 10 centimeters at a time. One slip and that's the end for the Germans are already below me in the foyer. I close the trap door and cover the cracks with a cloth. Just before the raid, Chaim and Fifi had lunch in the foyer below the hiding place. As a normal safety measure, they always took the dishes into the hiding attic and placed them on a brick wall that they had to step over to get to the attic floor. With a clatter, a spoon or a fork drops on the stone edge. There isn't even any time left to grow rigid with fear. I hear many boots in the square. The entire church must be surrounded. Footsteps approach, a soft call, just open up. It's the sexton's wife. I turn on the light and see a spoon right on the edge of the stone wall, just a few more millimeters, and it would have clattered to the floor of our hiding place, which is the thin attic ceiling of the hollow sounding foyer to which the Germans were so close. Our aunt, Hadassah, changed hiding places six times. When there were family difficulties at hiding place number two, a friend of the Brillenburg Wurz, Rick Deckers, took Hadassah into her home. Rick, a nurse and a resistant worker, became a link between Chaim and Fifi and their daughters. Once, Tante Rick picked me up and brought me to visit the Brillenburg Wurz family. Mrs. Brillenburg Wurz told her daughters to take me outside to the back garden to show me the chicken and rabbits. I never knew till the end of the war that while I was in the yard looking at the chickens, my father and mother were watching me through a little window in the church tower. On the one hand, this must have been very special to them to see that I was a healthy, cheerful child who was well taken care of. On the other hand, so sad, because under no circumstances could I know they were there hiding in the church, so they could not just come out and hug me. My mother Miriam wrote about the day she had to move to her third and final hiding place. <clears throat> when Miriam arrived, there were three other Jewish children already hiding there. Every host of a person in hiding was different. Some did it mainly because of the goodness of their heart, some for religious reasons, some for money, and maybe some for more sinister reasons. I was scared and wondered what kind of house and people I would be moved to. In January, 1943, on a windy and very cold day, a young woman from the underground came for me. I said goodbye for the third time, sad and fearful. Miriam wrote this note to her parents shortly after arriving at her new hiding place. In the note, she reassures her parents that she received a letter from Judith, that she has enough to eat, and she describes her cozy bedroom. But that quickly changed. 
For a short while, we slept in regular beds in different rooms. Then the Germans started to unexpectedly search homes for hidden weapons, hidden Jews, and hidden pilots. It became too dangerous at night. The four of us had to sleep under the kitchen floor because you couldn't get to a hiding place fast enough. Every night at seven, for the remaining years of the war, more than two years, we said good night, and the four of us went down into our little night prison. For the first year, Judith hid with three older women. Because of increased rates in the neighborhood, she had to leave. I had no knowledge about anyone during the last year and a half of the war. No idea who was where and if still alive. I remember having my teddy bear with me throughout those two and a half years, but the rest of the time is a big blank. In hindsight, I believe I know why. When Judith realized our book would be published, she made the difficult decision to share her complete story. She had written about it with plans to leave it for her three daughters to read after her death. You're looking at the back of a photograph of the couple who had viewed it. The image on the front shows them receiving recognition for hiding her. At the bottom, in Judith's handwriting, you can read the crimes of the father and two of his sons. The last family I was hiding with was where it happened. The father, his two sons, 16 and 17 years old, abused me. There was nobody I could go to. I never told my parents. Years after, Poppy submitted their names to the righteous list in Yad Vashem. This is Judith's fair that she had had with her throughout her time in hiding. In 2016, Judith, her daughter, and I requested that the father who hid her uh, be removed from the righteous at Yad Vashem. He was the opposite of moral and virtuous. I met with the director of the Department of the Righteous and gave her Yudit's written account. The Yad Vashem board and a judge reviewed the case and his name was removed. My father, Nathan's fifth and longest hiding place was in the home of Theo and Betsy Van Dalen. He was 12 years old when he started hiding there together with his parents and sisters. Theo had false paper for us and we had to learn to be Hans and Hanny Westerhuis. We waited in the third class waiting room crowded with strangers, many of them German soldiers, but nobody took notice of us. We traveled to Chent, a very small farming village in the rural area between the Val and the Rhine River. Theo was a Dutch policeman who enacted brave and sometimes humorous plots to sabotage the German war effort. His effort included helping uh, others who were hiding Jews by stealing food stamps and warning them of impending searches. Nathan's father, Isaac, or Itzhak, my grandfather, joined Theo uh, in his resistant work, for which they received certificates from Eisenhower for gallant service in assisting the escape of airline soldiers from the enemy. Nathan's account reads like an adventure, uh, adventure story. The Germans shot down bombers and fighters over Holland. Theo must have had good connection with the Dutch underground because that winter he had more guests, Canadian, English and American pilots on their way back to England. I practiced my English and my chess on the poor downed air crew member. We also kept war maps, which we prepared ourselves. My father, David, changed hiding addresses six times. He was 13 when he left for hiding place number one in a wallpaper factory under the care of the factory superintendent. His story begins. I left home with one suitcase. I wasn't wearing a star and had false papers under the name of Dirk Van Leeuwen. When David had to move five weeks later, a friend of his parents was to take him to a new hiding place. The two of them were stopped by the Dutch Nazi police. They separated, interrogated, and beat them, and then miraculously let them go. David went into hiding with his, so David then went into hiding with his father, Erwin, but that apartment was crowded and Erwin didn't think it was safe, so David moved again. 
A man from the underground arranged for me to go to Friesland, to farm country in the north. I remember very distinctly when I left my father because it was the last I ever saw of him. I went to a particular street corner. A man said, follow me, and I followed him. Then you see the other man there, follow him, but don't make contact. I walked eight or nine meters behind him. The first man walked way behind us to make sure I wasn't followed. Then a woman picked me up and said, you're going with me. And we went to the railroad station. We took the train over the Zaudersee and the boat to the northern part of Holland, Friesland. A different woman picked me up and brought me to a little farming community. This was my final destination. In Friesland, David learned the local dialect and went to school where he caused some mischievous trouble. After school, he worked for a farmer, got caught in a rainstorm and fell ill. I developed pneumonia and realized I was not like the others. I couldn't go to the hospital. The amazing part was Everyone from the village brought me cake that they'd made before they went to church. The whole village was concerned for my well-being, so I recuperated. Erwin began writing a memoir two days after he sent his son David, my father, to a safer hiding place. July 21st, 1943. How shall I begin to record the things that occupied me during the last three and a half years? on a day that brings me particular disappointments because I have received no news about my son who left me two days ago to go to a different place in Holland. Neither my mother nor my father knew Erwin's memoir lay hidden in an envelope with my grandmother's papers in my mother's Holocaust drawer. I knew almost nothing about my grandfather until I found this in 2006. The beginning of his memoir continues why do I begin just today? Most likely because I am alone with my thoughts, because I no longer have my daily occupation, because I can no longer contribute in the way I have been accustomed, because the chance to commit my entire being to help my family and myself has been taken from me. Perhaps too, the helplessness in which I find myself condemned to sitting still, the unaccustomed quiet. This index card shows that Erwin worked for the Jewish Council and that he was exempt from deportation because of this work. Exemptions were only temporary and Erwin went into hiding in July, 1943. The handwritten O at the top left above the name Geismar stands for the word, the Dutch word that Robert Jan told us about, onderdupper, a person in hiding. Erwin was caught in hiding and arrived in the West Westerbork transit camp on September 23rd, 1943. This date is written in black at the top right. He was in barrack 67, written under the date. This was a punishment barrack for people arrested in hiding. They were given less food, had to perform forced labor and had a greater chance of being put on the next transport. The date written in red is when Erwin was transported to Auschwitz. He was murdered in Auschwitz on November 19, 1943. When this card was decoded for me just last Thursday, I felt what I might describe as a sense of almost panic and fear. Somehow this evidence made Erwin's terrible circumstances real to me in a way I had never experienced before. Erwin left us his wishes. In the end, I hope that my lines will be read by people who will see how we struggled under terrible circumstances and that the reader will want to take up this struggle that we have fought and experienced from the front lines for the construction of a worthwhile humane society. Jews who were alive in the south of the Netherlands, uh, south of the Great Rivers, as it's called in the provinces of Limburg and uh, Brabant and Zeeland, uh, some of Zeeland, uh, saw liberation already in the fall of 1944. One of them, my great-grandfather, who was uh, hiding in actually the town of Fucht, uh, not in the camp, but right in the village of it. 
Uh, but for um, other Jews in hiding, uh, liberation only came uh, on the 5th of May, 1945. In, late, uh, in early 1941, the Germans had held a, a census of all the Jews, and this census uh, had determined there were 140,000 quote-unquote full Jews, that is, people with three or four Jewish grandparents, uh, which interestingly is the exact same number of Jews uh, who would be halakhically considered Jews, except the, 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 the reason why they are part of that 140,000 would be different. 14,500 half Jews and 6,000 quarter Jews. Now, uh, the full Jews were clearly targeted by the Germans and uh, half Jews could be targeted or not, dependent a little bit on their situation. Um, uh, so, uh, from a demographic point of view, um, uh, it, it is customary to look at the targeted group of Jews as being around 155,000 uh, in, uh, in, in the uh, early spring of 1941. Of those 105,000 Jews lost their lives, that is around 75%. Um, uh, of, the, of the full Jews and around 2% of the half Jews. Now, if we look at this, um, uh, we basically end up with 50,000 survivors. Um, and then the question is, where did they survive? How did they survive? Of the 50,000, 14,000 survived because they were half Jews. Uh, then uh, around 2,000 survived as refugees uh, in, in Switzerland. Uh, and also were able to get out through Spain and very few to England. 5,500 returned from the camps. There's one tenth of that group. Uh, around 8,000 uh, survived because they were in mixed marriages and their partner didn't divorce them. 1,000 survived in Westerbork. 3,000 survived because their Jewish status had not yet been cleared. It was an investigations went on throughout the war by one particular uh, lawyer, a German lawyer called Hals Kalmaya, and 15,000 survived in hiding. So a little less than one third of the Jews who in some way returned to the Netherlands in 1945 or who were still there, who we count as survivors, survived in hiding. Another statistic, of the Jews who were murdered in the Holocaust, 99% were murdered outside of the Netherlands. Um, in fact, the largest uh, group of deaths of Jews in the Netherlands, violent deaths were actually by suicide. So um, in that sense, the attitude of the Jewish council, uh, of the members of the Jewish council after the war, that in fact they had done the best they could, and this was in fact the best that could be done, can be somewhat understood because they were looking at the conditions always within the boundaries of the Netherlands. In some way, what happened in Sobibor, Auschwitz, Bergen-Belsen and Theresienstadt, the major destinations of Jews from the Netherlands, was outside of their, of their view. Now, the fatality of, um, of Jews is 68%, if you take the figure of 155,000, or 73% if you look at 140,000. The average Jewish uh, uh, for the fatality in, Euro in, in Europe in general is 63%, but as you might know in France and Belgium, who would in some way offer comparative situations, it was uh, uh, around a third or even less uh, compared to the Netherlands, and of course in Denmark, it was uh, the situation was radically different. And so historians, especially historians of what we now call the Holocaust, have since the 1960s trying to answer this question, why actually is the fatality of Jews in the Second World War in the Netherlands, why does it start approaching numbers that are more, uh, that are more common in Eastern Europe? And, uh, and, and they always quote a remark that uh, Eichmann made uh, after the war when he was uh, on trial in Jerusalem, when he said, there in the Netherlands, the transports ran so smoothly, it was a joy to watch them. So Eichmann himself, in some way, said this was a, a great success story for him. So there are many different reasons are brought to bear on this, uh, this really awful record of the Netherlands in the Holocaust. Uh, the, the country in the West that, that, that had no anti-Semitism, no, no, no political anti-Semitism before the war, 
But uh, some claim that this is exactly that uh, the lack of kind of political anti-Semitism that made in some way the Jews naive when they faced the Germans, that they didn't realize that the situation had uh, had, 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 had changed dramatically and that also the kind of patterns of adjustment and accommodation that existed before the war uh, did not work anymore. Another argument uh, which has been brought forward is the very efficiency of the Jewish Council. If you, as long as you were registered with the Jewish Council, it means as long as you didn't go into hiding because the Jewish Council didn't support Jews in hiding, you could survive in the Netherlands as a Jew, even when you lost your job, you lost your capital, you lost your homes, whatever like that, the Jewish council would take care of you. And the Jewish council, there are actually movies made of the activities of the Jewish council, and you see warehouses full of stuff to be given to the members of the community. So it is in some way also the very efficiency of the Jewish council in taking care of Jews while they were in the Netherlands that in some way made people uh, trust the Jewish council when they ought not to be trusted. Then another argument that has been brought forward is the pillar structure of that society. I use the uh, term um, uh, coined by the English philosopher Norman Giras, uh, the contract of mutual indifference. That when Holocaust historians and philosophers and survivors talk about indifference as what made the Holocaust possible, the Dutch society was based on indifference. There was very little uh, intergroup loyalty between the pillars. Then the Calvinist uh, virtue of obedience to authority, which certainly existed uh, in the Calvinist churches, but the paradox is that, of course, also the Calvinist churches and especially the ultra-Orthodox Calvinist churches were also centers of resistance against the Germans. But probably um, a very important other thing was that there was no collaborating government in the Netherlands. Um, in France, we had the Vichy regime, and the Vichy regime can be blamed for almost for so much that happened in France during the Holocaust. But the Vichy regime, ultimately, at the expense of, uh, of refugee Jews in France, was willing to spend some political capital in its negotiations with the Germans to save uh, Jews who were French citizens. In the Netherlands, the government was in exile and the civil servants who were maintaining the, gov the, the government organization didn't have the kind of authority that a Pétain or a Laval had in negotiating with the, uh, with the Germans to improve conditions. And then ultimately two other things. I of Seyss Inquart to deliver Holland as a fully Nazified country to Hitler for the incorporation in the Greater German Reich and the size of the security services the and, the, uh, uh, and the German police forces in the Netherlands, which in some way created the condition uh, uh, together uh, that made it for Jews very difficult uh, to survive the, the Holocaust. But of course, uh, uh, this, is, this is all hindsight and of us were of very little use, of course, to those who faced uh, this ordeal, like the and Gasmar families. Thank you. That night, for the first time, all four of us could go outside without fear. We went to the center of Harlem to see the Canadian army drive into the city. Friendly soldiers on tanks, no one screaming at us. Five years of horror were over. It was amazing that you could walk in the street without being scared. Just amazing. After a few days, it became clear that the German would not return and we became Jews again. In 1945, Fifi wrote in her diary, you can hardly comprehend that our family emerged from that hell in one piece. They emerged, but the lives they had no longer existed. Other people were living in their homes. Years of education were lost. They couldn't relate to their old friends or family members. And David's father didn't return. The top row is from before the 1940 German occupation. The bottom row after the 1945 liberation. 
They went in as children and came out as adults. Of the eight narrators in Invisible Years, seven survived. When they came out of hiding, they learned that 61 close family members were murdered. Their mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, grandfathers, aunts, uncles, and cousins. This list remembers them. It includes names, relationships, and ages, and also the date and place of murder. Most were murdered in Sobibor and Auschwitz. The youngest was six years old, the oldest, 72. This is how our mothers were able to continue. We were not supposed to talk about it. There was no way you could possibly think about it and build a normal life. So you had to just forget. The three of us sisters never talked about our experiences. It was over and it was time to start a new life. We'll end with words of thanks that our grandfather Chaim wrote about those who helped him and his family. When we were free once again, it was as if life itself had been put back into our hands for our very life had been stripped from us. And it wasn't because we deserved it that death passing by us so closely had spared us. Gladness and gratitude overwhelmed me. G gratitude to all who supported us during the war years and an emotion of thankfulness that I will call divine. But this feeling was almost immediately stifled remembering just one of the millions of children who had not returned. Surely countless ones among them must have been a thousand times more deserving than we. Four years ago, a film was discovered that brought the happy pre-war Desita girls to life. Watching it was amazing, and we want to share a little bit of it with you. Thank you so much. And I just, before we move on to questions, I just want to thank Robert Jan for doing this with Sharon and I to have his knowledge of the history, supporting these personal stories is really incredible. To Maydeen for, for working with us for months to put this together, um, for the ambassador, for the beautiful introduction and to you all and the ghetto fighters for hosting this series. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much. And I wanna thank our, uh, our speakers. I wanna thank uh, Daphne and Sean, first of all. Uh, it really became a family uh, a joint uh, <laughs> program creating this series. And I wanna thank you for that. And of course, Robert Jan, for your uh, uh, insight, and you can see in the um, in the chat box that many people are so thankful for having the historical uh, insets put in. And really, this is the way the book is written. So for me, it was almost like uh, <laughs> going through the book again. There's always uh, the personal story of the family with little uh, excerpts. So you can say, "Well, go to page this and that and get the historical background to everything." So I think many people appreciated that as well. Of course, I want to thank again the ambassador, uh, His Excellency uh, Hans Doctor, for being here and giving us this uh, incredible uh, uh, opening remarks and of course EGAL as well. Uh, we do have a few questions and actually um, there was a, a survivor in uh, the audience. I also want to uh, acknowledge that uh, Hadassah's mother is here with us, Yudit. Uh, of the three sisters and you saw her in the film just now and you heard her story. So we just wanna say Shalom coming to us from Israel. There she is. Hine, say hi. Shalom. Hi. Shalom. <laughs> Shalom. Shalom. So she's with us and um, also Chaim Eroit is with us as well. He, he wrote in the chat box a little bit about his uh, personal story. 
Um, and the questions actually, one of the questions, and I think Sharon started to uh, give an answer when um, the, the sisters were talking about, we have to go on with life and not talk about, why do you think that your uh, mothers didn't want to share the story with you, um, at least until the commemoration? Uh, why do you think that they kept silent all those years and kept the drawers a secret from their daughters, from their family? So that's the first question, the big question. Do you want to take that, Sharon? Yes. Um, I think uh, um, it has a few levels. I think they wanted us to have normal life. Uh, and I think they thought uh, all these stories uh, will uh, prevent it. Um, also, I think, which is uh, strange to hear, but uh, they thought it's not interesting. I have to say that when we were gathering the material and writing the book, my mother often said, but who would be interested in it? Uh, it's not interesting. And it's uh, strange because we are telling her, this is so interesting. It's not only a personal story. Uh, it's a general story, but also the uh, a private family story is so interesting. Um, so I think they thought it's not interesting. It was the past. We need to move on. If we'll think about it all the time, we won't be able to move on. We want our children to have normal life. They never spoke Dutch in the house. They wanted us to be Israelian. So they spoke <laughs> only Hebrew, yes, which wasn't their language. And um, I think th these are the reasons. And that's something that's very uh, it, it, typical for many survivors that made a decision that in order to go forward, we have to keep these, our lives during the Holocaust in a, a, a physical or a virtual drawer uh, yes. put away and kept. And uh, it's to, I guess it's the power of memory that uh, actually brought you together and to discover these drawers together after the commemoration in Rotterdam. And we'll be talking a little more about that in the second part of the series. Um, uh, can I add something yes, to this? As a historian? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, just I put my historian hat up again. Yes. It's of course also generational. I mean, if we are, if, if, if I look at, uh, at a generation uh, of, uh, uh, of, of Holocaust survivors and, you know, the youngest generation of survivors were really children at the time, at that time, uh, society in general said, you know, what, what is your private life is really of no relevance to, to, to society at large. I mean, that was a commonly shared uh, thing. And, and of course, they started changing in the 1960s and 70s in general. For, you know, so at a certain moment, uh, as part of women's emancipation, gay emancipation, all kinds of emancipations, our private lives becomes something of public concern. And instead that we say we're going to fit in the box that society has created for us, willingly without protest, we're going to say, you know, what, what I dream about at night in my bed or who I love or whatever like that, that is that 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 is that has political significance, it has social significance, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is I think also where you know the tradition of Sharon and Daphne and even myself that the private has become political uh, and 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 in some way uh, this is why I think these projects are also welcome today. Yes, actually, in Israel, we had uh, an, uh, uh, a historian that wrote about this, uh, saying the privatization of the Holocaust, first of all, and, the, and the, the very famous poem here in Israel, every person has a name. And I agree, and somebody wrote this, uh, a few people wrote as second generation, that their parents and in-laws, if they had in-laws also, many of them kept silent. And someone also mentioned that once they got older and realized that maybe their children wouldn't be able to pass on this history, that the floodgates uh, opened. And that could be very true uh, as well. Uh, Daphne, someone asked about the card, where you found the card. I know it, you said it, but it, I have it in the script, but can you say again w where the card came from? I was I was also looking at it like... Um, I only... 
found out about these cards last January. So um, that card is not in the book. None of the cards are in my book. But um, Alexander Stuttgarten, I think is his last name. Um, he's responsible for the Stolperstein um, project in specifically in the Netherlands. And I've been working with him on a Stolperstein for Irwin. And um, last January, he told me about the Arelson archives in the Netherlands. I, that's what I thought. Okay. And they've just um, recently, um, relatively recently, digitized all of the cards um, owned by the Jewish Council. And there's a card for every Jew in the Netherlands. Um, so I found the cards for every single, what, you know, whether they lived or they were murdered or in hiding or deported, um, there's a card for everyone. Um, so I found the cards for everyone in my family and extended family. And um, just recently, um, I mean, putting together this presentation um, and a workshop that I'm doing in a couple of weeks, um, an educator I was working with asked me about the information on the card and I hadn't gotten to it yet. <laughs> so I put out a call to two really helpful people in the Netherlands. I can't see everyone on my screen, but I know that Jos Engels is here. <laughs> and um, he um, did a bunch of research and um, also Jan, um, Eric, Jan, Jan Eric um, no, no, Doubleman. wrote about that in the chat, that you, get, you sent a link and everything. It's a very yes. important and it's open so so um yeah so finding out what the coding is on the cards was really critical and um it's amazing how you know a letter and a number tells you a whole story absolutely and uh, thank you so much for sharing that it really is hot off the press literally i was so surprised to see it and to see after all these years of researching and putting together the memoir you still have things that you're discovering it really is a never ending journey and I can hardly wait for the next two uh, sessions in our, uh, in our series. Um, and can, what I can will- I, ask, Can I add something? Wait. Is it possible to add something? I don't see who is saying that. Um, I'm, I've been listening to it and I'm on it. I don't know, I have a, I'm on the video. Oh, it's Sarah. I see Sarah Cohen. Is that correct. who? Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. I just wanted to say that maybe one element of not wanting to talk about it was the pervasive um, atmosphere in Israel. I think till the Eichmann uh, um, judgment trial that um, that uh, the Jews were brought to slaughter like, like sheep. And a lot of Holocaust survivors felt ashamed to talk about it. Um, and so there was a kind of conspiracy of silence, mm. which opened up, I think, after the trial of Eichmann. But that's something that was very strong in the early years. That's also true. That's, that's the history of the, whole, uh, the Holocaust in, uh, in Israel. Very true. Sarah, thank you so much for, for Madine, sharing that with us. Can, Madine? Yes. This is Rody Glass, and I'm a survivor from Westerbork, the Netherlands. And I wrote in the chat box yes. that I just returned last week because I was also at the unveiling of the National Monument in Amsterdam. There were only 300 people, and COVID or no COVID, I was invited and I wasn't <laughs> going to miss it. And this is a place that everybody in the, who had family in the Netherlands should visit because these people are dust on the grounds of Poland, you know, and there is, they had no Matsevo, they had no graves, they have no anything. This is a place where people can go and look up there and there are people of 102,000 names of Jews and Roma Sinti are on this wall. And the monument was designed by Daniel Liebeskind, who was a genius. And it, it's a fabulous place and it's very emotional for me because my family is there. Uh, I live near Chicago at this time, but um, but I am Dutch born and, and I'm from Amsterdam. And I heard what, what the professor said and I don't agree with, 
I mean, there should be things that should be added to that, but that's not possible. Uh, but this monument took 15 years because of the Dutch citizens, again, were so much against it. You know, they weren't against it because of the trees. It was a matter of anti-Semitism. And, and it's, it's, but it, it, after 15 years, Jack Chris Haver, who was the head of the Auschwitz committee, got it going. And there's a, a film of how he went through the courts and through the Supreme Court in the Netherlands and everything to get this done. And all the people that were murdered in Holland, of course, 80,000 of them lived in, in Amsterdam, but in the whole of the Netherlands are mentioned there. And if they're not, you can still add them because there is part of a wall that is blank for people they might have missed. Mm. You know, you can adopt it for, you can pay money, but they will do it for nothing. And it's the most beautiful, beautiful monument. And I think it's the only monument in anywhere that has all the names of the country's murdered victims on it. And well, we want to thank you very much for your statement. I want to uh, continue on. There was one more thing that we have to cover because a few people asked what happened to Hadassah. <laughs> uh, two people actually were asking what happened to the youngest daughter? Uh, what happened to Hadassah? So maybe we'll end well, with one, okay. one more piece of information. Uh, actually, we didn't tell what happened to anyone. Uh, the book has a chapter uh, that calls after, and you can see what happened, yes? yes. And uh, you can also see who got married to who, you yes. know, there are marriages there. Uh, Hadassah uh, and Judith and Fifi and Chaim uh, came to Israel together. Miriam uh, and Nathan and David uh, came earlier uh, with uh, the Akshara group. Um, and they all be li build life in Israel. Uh, afterwards, uh, Miriam and uh, David went to the United States. And you can find a lot of, uh, it's a short par uh, uh, chapter, but you can learn uh, about their life after the war. Uh, they all had very fulfilling, happy uh, lives with big families. We have a lot of children and uh, yeah. <laughs> And I, I just want to add, um, since the question was brought up about Hadassah, um, there are nine narrators in our book, but eight were in the Netherlands. And Hadassah's future husband, Zigi, was not in the Netherlands. So we didn't tell his story today. Um, he was in Poland and he fled Poland. His story is kind of like a bonus track at the end of a CD, which is at the end of the book um, and provides greater perspective to um, the enormity of what was going on in, in Europe during World War II. So he went to Poland and Russia and India and um, had quite the horrific tragedies and adventures along the way. Um, so that is in the book too. And of course, I want to recommend to everyone, we put a link for the Netherlands and we put a link for Amazon for those that speak English for the book. I highly, I, I finished the book in a weekend. Uh, literally, I couldn't put it down and it's a huge book and very heavy. Um, it really is an incredible experience to, to go through the book in the way it's written as a, a memoir, but also a dialogue and a conversation. It's also uh, uh, what we call like a, a table book, a coffee book that you put on the table so that people can just look through it. It's an incredible experience. And of course, we're going to continue our uh, exploration of this amazing uh, uh, family story in our next two sessions. And, and I want to thank again, everyone. First of all, our, our speakers, the ambassador. I want to thank all the people that came to listen today. And I want to thank you for your questions and for the comments. We, and with that, I want to say shalom. Uh, it's good evening or good night here in Israel. And it's a uh, good afternoon in the States and probably good morning somewhere. Uh, and we'll see you next month.